leading out in world revolutions, it was a secret society controlling them behind the scenes. This man took over after Mazzini. He was a commander in the, North, the southern armies. After the war, he settled down to study in Arkansas. And from there, this man with a tremendous mind became one of the world's most renowned authorities on pagan idolatry. He became the leader of the Illuminati in time. This that I'm about to read is a letter to the Palladian Council, written July 14, 1889, from Albert Pike. He, like Weishaupt, was the head of the Luciferian conspiracy in his day, Pawns in the Game by Guy Carr. And here is the letter. That which we say to the crowd is we worship God, but it is a God that one worships without superstition. The religion should be, by all us initiates of the high degree, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai, the name they give the Christians, is God also, for the absolute can exist only as two gods. Though, so they're saying that Jesus, or God, is both good and evil. And the good part of it, they're saying, is Lucifer, and the evil is Jesus Christ. Thus, the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. They don't believe in Satan. They believe that Jesus is evil, not Satan. And the true and pure philo philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer. The equal of Christ, or Adane, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adane, the God of darkness and evil, Albert Pike. Isn't that amazing what these people believe? They're worshipers of Lucifer. And friends, this is their plan. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, or the Nazis, he says here. Those who are working in favor of the Christian world the atheists who are working against it. And we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clear to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. Finally, out in public view, a manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. They want another war, folks. It was Albert Pike who laid out the plan for three world wars. One, to open up Palestine, two, to form a state in Palestine between the second and third, to raise the Arab world and the world of Israel. And once they were armed and ready, and the world was siding on one side or another, they would form an international war. And that war is on our horizon today. Ellen White told us in Evangelism, page 623, a power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. Those who are yielding to the passion for confederacy are working out the plans of the enemy. The cause will be followed by the effect. For a hundred years, we may have had the privilege of knowing what was going on in those secret societies through inspiration. An example of the kind of mind that exists in this spawn of the Jesuit order can be seen in this man, Aleister Crowley, who was a, a 33rd degree Mason. Aleister Crowley, 33rd degrees. Aleister Crowley was also a member of the Kabbalistic organization of the Golden Dawn in London. And here is his law. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Every man and every woman is a star. Man has a right to live by his own law. Man has a right to eat what he will, drink what he will, dwell where he will, move where he will. Man has a right to, to think what he will, speak and write whatever he will and make what he will. Man has a right to love as he will. Take your fill and will of love, where and when you will. Man has a right to kill those who would thwart these rights. The slave shall serve. Do you like that law? It sure appeals to the carnal heart. And this law is spreading among the masses of the world today. It's the mind of Satan, folks. Secret Societies and Subversive Movements by Nesta Webster tells us that this conspiracy took place among the Jews. And I'm sure that much of it has taken a place in the Sanhedrin circles. But the fiery Jesuits describes clearly that the control of the money in this world 
is in the hands of the Roman Catholic Church today and especially in the hands of the Jesuits. They're the ones that claim to become the Jew among the Jews. They're leading out in the Zionist conspiracy. It was their interests that fomented the writing of the Communist Manifesto. It was their interests that financed this man to go in, Lenin, to go in and cause the revolution. The church was hoping to conquer the Eastern Orthodox Church. This revolution has not stopped. The communists may have left her in that revolution and took it for themselves. But the, the war continues today. January 4, 1862, Ellen White tells us, I was shown before Lincoln's administration, the former administration planned and managed for the South to rob the North of implements of war. They were contemplating a determined rebellion or revolution. The North did not understand the bitter, dreadful hatred of the South towards them and were unprepared for the deep laid plots. Volume 1 of the Testimonies 253. What was behind these deep laid plots? In the book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome by Father Chiniqui, he tells us that he had hired Lincoln to be his lawyer uh, to protect him against a suit from the church. Lincoln was faithful and the man was gotten off. And this is a signature on the letter of the IOU found in the book of Lincoln. Listen to the words here. Dear Mr. Lincoln, I, answer, I answered, allow me to tell you that the joy I should naturally feel for such a victory is destroyed in my mind by the fear of what it may cost you. There were then in the crowd not less than 10 or 12 Jesuits from Chicago and St. Louis who came to hear my sins of condemnation to the penitentiary, but it was on their heads that you have brought the thunders of heaven and earth. Nothing can be compared to the expression of their rage against you when you not only wrenched me from their cruel hands, but you were making the walls of the courthouse tremble under the awful, superhumanly eloquent denunciation of their infamy, diabolical malice, and total want of Christian human principle in the plot they had formed for my destruction. What troubles my soul just now and draws tears to my eyes is that it seems to me that I have read your sentence of death in their fiendish eyes. How many other noble victims have fallen, have already fallen at their feet? Lincoln said, he looked at his watch after a talk with, with Father Chiniqui in his office in the White House, I am sorry that the 20 minutes I had consecrated our interview has all, almost passed away. I will be forever grateful for the warning words you have addressed to me about the dangers ahead of, to my life from Rome. I know that they are not imaginary dangers. If I were fighting against a Protestant South as a nation, there would be no danger of assassination. The nations who read the Bible fight bravely on the battlefields, but they do not assassinate their enemies. The Pope and the Jesuit, with their infernal inquisition, are the only organized powers in the world which have recourse to the dagger of the assassin to murder those whom they cannot convince with their arguments or conquer with their sword. Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves than against the real American Protestants. Here again, we read from, uh, from the words of Abraham Lincoln. Those antisocial laws today are written on her banners with blood of ten million of martyrs. It is under those bloody banners that 6,000 Roman Catholic priests, Jesuits, and bishops in the United States are marching to the conquest of this republic, backed by their seven millions of blind and obedient slaves. Those laws, which are still the ruling laws of Rome, were the main cause of the last rebellion of the southern states. Yes, without Romanism, the last awful civil war would, would have been impossible. Jeff Davis would never have dared to attack the North had he not had assurance from the Pope that the Jesuits, the bishops, the priests, and the whole people of the Church of Rome under the, under the name mask of democracy would help him. These diabolical anti-social laws of Rome caused the Roman Catholic beer guard to be the man chosen to fire the first gun at Fort Sumter. It is, not, is it not an absolute absurdity, says Lincoln, to give to a man a thing which he has sworn to hate, curse, and destroy? And does not the Church of Rome hate, curse, and destroy liberty of conscience when she can do, she can do it safely? I am for liberty of conscience in the noblest, broadest, highest sense, but I cannot give liberty of conscience to the Pope and to his followers, the Papists, so long as they tell me through their councils, theologians, and canon laws that their conscience orders them to burn my wife, 
strangle my children and cut my throat when they find their opportunity. This does not seem to be understood by the people today. But sooner or later, the light of common sense will make it clear to everyone that no liberty of conscience can be granted to men who are sworn to obey the Pope, who pretends to have the right to put to death those who differ from him in religion. He says the common people see and hear the big noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy cars. They call them Jeff Davis, Lee, Toombs, Beargard, Simmons. And they honestly think that they are the motive power, the first cause of our troubles. But this is a mistake, says Lincoln. The true motive power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the colleges, schools of the Jesuits, the, conv the convents, nuns, and the confessional boxes of Rome. There is a fact which is too much ignored by the American people and with which I am acquainted only since I became a president. It is that the best, the leading families of the South have received their educated in great part, if not in whole, from the Jesuits and the nuns. Now, after the assassination of Lincoln, uh, this brother, Chiniqui, is, is talking in the book. After I mixed my tears with those of the grand country of my adoption, I fell on my knees and asked my God to grant me to show to the world what I knew to be the truth, that that horrible crime was the work of popery. And after 20 years of constant and most difficult researches, I came fearlessly today before the American people to say and prove that the President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by the priests and Jesuits of Rome. In the, book, in the book of the testimonies given in the prosecution of the assassin of Lincoln published by Ben Pittman and in the two volumes of the trial of John Surratt in 1867, we have the legal and irrefutable proof that the plot of the assassins of Lincoln was matured if not started in the house of Mary Surratt. But who were living in the house at that time? The legal answer is the most devout Catholics in the city. The sworn testimonies show more than that. They show that it was the common rendezvous of the priests of Washington. These people were Roman Catholics. It was a Jesuit conspiracy that destroyed Abraham Lincoln. The church planned the destruction of the world and the regaining of its power through world wars. And this is brought out in this book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. She tried with Bismarck to get him to fight for her, to Kaiser Wilhelm to get him to fight for her. And in time, she brought about the reaction of the Serbians against her effort to force them to Catholicism, an assassination attempt on one behind the Catholic plot. And that led to the, war, the, the First Great War, the First World War. In time, this man, Pius XI, brought to power Mussolini in a desire to regain some political power. In time, in 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed, and the church was given money and some land. But more than that, prestige again among the nations, and Mussolini was raised to power in Italy. In this book, The Destruction of Freemasonry Through a Revelation of Her Secrets, by General Eric Ludendorff, he brings irrefutable evidence, the evidence of court records before us in that book, that in Germany, in the, court, in the secret societies, the Andrean Mason Lodges there, they were planning on using the German people as a takeoff point for a war. What was the purpose behind that war? We discover it clearly. This is the Nuncio Pacelli from the Vatican to Bavaria. There in Bavaria, he worked secretly with von Papen, and in time they signed a court concordat between Hitler and the Vatican. Hitler was raised to power by the Roman Church. It was his relationship with them that made him the man. Speeches, his Mein Kampf, were written by Jesuits, and he became a god in that age. And also as the secret mechanisms of Roman Catholic subversion were taking place in the international world, we find that the IG Farben drug complex and the Rockefeller dynasty merged and formed the wealthiest and most powerful cartel in the world and it was